Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rao's IAS. Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Since today is Sunday edition of Daily News Simplified, we have taken all those important news which have appeared in the explained section of Indian Express on the first week of August and today is the Hindu newspaper. The articles which we are going to cover today have been displayed on the screen and let us now begin the discussion. So the first article which we have taken is from today's The Hindu, Israel steps up airstrikes on Gaza Strip. So Israeli airstrikes flattened homes in Gaza on Saturday and rocket barrages into southern Israel persisted, raising fears of an escalation in conflict that has killed at least 15 people in coastal strip. And this is just one of the instances every week when you get to read about Israel and Palestinian conflict. And whenever you read an article on Israel-Palestinian conflict, always there are terms like Golan Heights, Gaza Strip, West Bank, and terms like Israeli settlements. And so it is very, very difficult for beginners and aspirants to understand these terms. And in order to be able to understand that, you have to go through complicated history which has to be simplified and daily news simplified is all about that so today we will understand first what is the historical context into israel palestinian conflict which will enable you to understand all the news articles which appear henceforth and so in order to be able to understand what is happening right now we will have to go back in history to the time when there was extreme persecution of jews which resulted in the migration of jews from europe and various other parts of the world to palestine which led to the passage of UN resolution which were followed by two important wars which were fought by Israel and Arabian countries 1948 Arab-Israel war and Israel six-day war. So now the current map of Israel and Palestine which you see on Google map or on world map today is something which did not exist 100 years ago because 100 years ago there were very few Jews who lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Most of them had already migrated to various European cities and countries. But the problem was that wherever Jews went, they had to face extreme persecution both from Muslims as well as from Christians. And hence a movement emerged among Jews living in European countries which took up the cause of persecution and talked about escaping this persecution. It actively talked about creation of a state solely or only meant for Jews. And this particular movement came to be known as Zionist movement. So basically Jews were persecuted in European countries. They decided they will gather, unite and move to location on earth where they will establish their own state which will be just for them. And the place which was identified by them was Palestine. And so once it was decided that Palestine will be the place where they will set up their own country, they started to migrate. But the question arises, how could this migration take place? Now they could migrate because of special situation which was created as a result of World War I. If you know the context of World War I, you know that as a result of it, the Ottoman Empire which controlled the most of the region of the Middle East disintegrated as a result of World War I. And as the settlement of World War I, the administration of the Palestinian region was handed over to the British people. And you can see the Palestine in the red color marked over here and you can see that under British, French and Russian protection. And this particular arrangement where British, French and Russian governments decided to trifurcate the whole region among themselves is known as sykes picot Agreement. So two things happened simultaneously in favor of Jews. The disintegration of Ottoman Empire, an empire which claimed to be the protector of the Muslims. The existence of such an empire would have prevented the inflow of Jews to this particular region because it was controlled by a very very powerful Ottoman Empire which disintegrated in 1915 to 16 and at the same time the territory Palestine which was identified under the Zionist movement will be the place where all the Jews will migrate fell under the British occupation and Britishers since the beginning were quite sympathetic to the cause of the Jews protection and their persecution but as soon as the world war ended and a new set of governments started to form in Europe, another factor was added into the migration or giving a big boost to the migration of Jews from Europe to the Palestine, which was emergence of a lot of fascist governments across Europe. 
one of them you know is hitler another one was mussolini and so what you have across europe is wide level of persecution which extended well beyond germany and so as more and more fascist and anti jews government rose up in europe the persecution of jews reached unprecedented level not even seen during medieval times and this resulted into the kind of migration which was never seen by jews in the history so now starting with zionist movement as reason number 2 disintegration of ottoman empire and occupation of palestine by britishers and third is that now you have fascist regime which were actively persecuting jews which was unseen before and so as a combined result of all these factors the more and more number of jews started arriving in a very very small territory of palestine which was earlier mainly populated by arab muslims and so what you have till 1947 is that this palestinian territory is just receiving more and more number of jews flowing in from germany from sweden from france and from various other places in europe and they are just arriving and making up their own homes inside palestine because this particular territory is controlled by british they are allowing the people to come in but by the time 1947 and 1948 came a massive alarm was raised by local arabs because now they were concerned about the increasing population of jews and they started an armed militant movement against the in migrants or the jews and so this of course resulted in a retaliation from jewish side and this led to a lot of violence in the one particular year from 1947 to 48 but now it is 1947 48 and world war 2 has already ended and now the britishers had made up their mind to vacate the middle east including the palestinian region and so they decided to establish a proper state which the world would recognize as israel or nation state for jewish people and hence united nations security council passed a resolution in which voted to split the earlier palestinian region into three states one arab state another one jewish state and the third one would be the jerusalem city and so this un resolution was passed in 1947 and this resolution is known by the name of un resolution number no. 181 and so now is the time to understand how the map of palestine changed after this particular resolution So you can clearly see that there are three colors in this map. Blue denotes the Jewish regions, pinkish orange color denotes the Arab regions, and the yellow one is international city of Jerusalem. So this was the condition starting 1948. And so this was the first time when the boundaries were actually drawn in the state of Palestine. So earlier what you had was complete Palestine owned and possessed and inhabited populated by Arabs. but after the resolution what you have is a trifurcation of the same state into three parts you can see clearly that jews were given a lot of territory and arabs were made limited to just the orangish areas and so this was the first time when the jews got the legal right recognition from across the world to make up their own home state or home nation so as you can totally understand it's quite common sensical what would have been the reception of this un resolution it was wholeheartedly accepted by jews because since 100 years there was a demand among the jews for their own home state which they finally got through un resolution number no. 181 but as far as arabs are concerned they completely rejected the un resolution it's not difficult to think why the response was such because the earlier territory which completely belonged to them 50% more than 50% of that was given to Jews and so they not only rejected the UN resolution but at the same time they said that any further talks would not be entertained and we are going to fight it back and take it away from the Jews and so here now what you have is genesis of one of the world's most cluttered and disputed territories when the arabs rejected the united nations resolution they also promised with each other that they are going to win back the areas which have been given to the jews which resulted in a lot of wars but we are going to keep ourselves limited to 1948 arab israel war and israel six day war because these are the two wars which have resulted into drastic changes in the map of the israel and palestine and these are the locations which are frequently asked in upsc prelims examination and through this discussion you will understand the importance of each and every territory so in 1948 following the declaration of the state of israel the group of arab nations known as arab league decided to intervene on behalf of their palestinian brothers 
by ordering their troops and military to marching into the areas of Palestine, especially those areas which were given to the Jews. Overall, the war was quite prolonged, but Israel emerged victorious because it not only retained its own mandate, it not only retained the territories which were allocated to it through UN resolution, but it was also able to capture around 60% of the territory which was given to the Arab people. So now after the end of this war, the Jews extended their area of control within Palestine region. And so for next 10 to 15 years, things remained almost the same until in 1967 when Israel fought six day war with its surrounding neighbors which was actually started by Israel because Israel had this kind of premonition that the neighboring states are going to attack it. And so Israel started conducting preemptive strikes on Egypt, Syria and Jordan. And the interesting outcome of the war was not just that it defeated the combined armies of Egypt, Syria and Jordan, but Israel also managed to get control over some of the most strategically important points in Egypt, Syria and Jordan, which would then go a long way in defending Israel in future. So for example, it captured completely Sinai Peninsula and Gaza Strip. It took away Golan Heights which are located over here from Syria and then it took West Bank which can be seen marked in the blue color over here and East Jerusalem from Jordan. So before the beginning of the war, Israel was just limited to the area which I am shading in blue color. It did not have Gaza Strip, it did not have Sinai Peninsula, it did not have West Bank, it did not have Syrian region of Golan Heights which are very very important strategically to protect Israel from Syria. But after the war ended, the Israel had access to Suez Canal through Sinai Peninsula. It completely controlled West Bank, Gaza Strip and also the Golan Heights. Now of course the current map of Israel does not show Sinai Peninsula as a part of Israel. And so that is because Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in response to Egypt becoming the first country, first Muslim country to recognize the existence of Israel as a formal state. So that was like a quid pro quo. You recognize us and we'll give back your territory to you. But it has held on, stuck to the other territories even now. It still controls Gaza Strip and West Bank. It still controls most of the Jerusalem. Now whenever you read the news about Israel and Palestine, this is the one term because of which the news appears and that is called the settlements of Israeli people in Palestine. So what are these settlements? Of, of course the Jewish people are settling in this particular region since more than 80 years now. And so what is this new stuff known as settlements? So settlements are basically civilian establishments for Jews. But they are known as settlements, there is a particular term settlement is used only for those colonies which are built on land occupied by Israel after 1967 war. So if you make a house or a home or a colony inside this particular region, there is no trouble. But we know that in 1967, Israel occupied and started controlling the West Bank as well. And so what Israel does is that it comes up with new colony here, expelling the Arabs from that particular region. And this has seen a continuous upswing in past 10 years, especially with the election of Mr. Netanyahu, who has been extremely, extremely nationalist in his outlook and approach towards the Arab people. So now this is a clear violation of UN resolution because the UN resolution limited the Jews only to the region which was allocated to them. But now these Jewish people have started to make their homes inside the Arabian territories as well. And so now what you see on the screen is a gradual transformation of Israel's ethnicity in terms of the occupation. And so the light green color in the dark background shows the continuous reduction in the area populated by Arabs and you can see a drastic decline after 1960 because then in 1970 onwards Israel's national government started to take up the colonies earlier settled by Arab people, expelled them because they have brute force on the ground and now they are making up territories, colonies and occupations inside the Palestinian lands. So these settlements have led to a lot of violence in this particular region. So that is the reason number one because of which we hear the news related to Israel and Palestine. Now the reason because of which in last 10 days Israel has appeared in the newspaper is because of the clashes taking place at Al-Aqsa Mosque which is the third holiest site in Islam. And it sits on a plateau which is also the holiest site for Jews who refer to it as the Temple Mount because it was the location of biblical temples. Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD with only the western wall remains. 
and the mosque was of course built much later and so what you have right now al aqsa mosque and then you have a wall which is the holiest site for jews and in recent years groups of religious and nationalist jews escorted by israeli police have started to visit the compound or this campus in greater numbers and they have started to hold prayers in defiance of the rules which were signed in 1967 now palestinians view the frequent visit by israelis as an attempt to ignite violence the palestinian view is that more and more israelis will start visiting and they will eventually take over the control over their one of the holiest mosque across the world which is the al aqsa mosque which is also one of the only few places still not controlled by the israeli people because this particular location containing both al aqsa mosque and the wall is under the custody of neighboring country jordan the site is open to tourists during certain times but only muslims are allowed to pray there and the western wall is the holiest site where the jews can pray and now since the jewish police has started to visit this particular region the palestinians and the arabs are now increasingly concerned about the increasing control of the israel on their holiest site The next article which we have taken had appeared in the explained section in Indian Express last week. What is carbon market and why does India want to create one? So the government has brought a bill to amend a 20 year old law, the Energy Conservation Act, and this article discusses the most significant provisions of the bill which is about creation of domestic carbon market. Now from the perspective of GS paper 3 environment section conservation environmental pollution and degradation environment impact assessment is a part of your syllabus and one of the most significant and important ways in which we have to fight the climate change is about climate action and within climate action we have two of the options available either mitigation or adaptation mitigation is about reducing the greenhouse gases emission into the atmosphere whereas adaptation is about realizing that a significant climate change and global warming has already taken place and the impact of this will be felt for a very long time and hence we need to adapt in order to survive now within mitigation there are a lot of strategies under which carbon market is one of the strategies so let's first understand what carbon market and how is it conceptualized under paris climate deal and then we will discuss the provisions of this particular bill Now market and non market mechanisms have been provided in the article 6 of the Paris climate deal and article 6 deals with mitigation of climate change which means reduction in the impact which the greenhouse gases are making by reducing the greenhouse gas emissions so if you have understood the paris climate deal you know that countries all across the world have promised to cut down their greenhouse gas emissions and those emission cuts are known by ndcs or nationally determined contributions which can be seen in orange color boxes here so if country a has promised ndc of this much amount which means that country a is going to cut down its greenhouse gases emission by this much amount and similarly the country b has also promised to cut down the emissions more than country a as you can see but let's say after 10 years country a has been able to perform better and it was able to cut down more than what it promised as you can see this much amount extra has been cut down in country's a's emissions because of its efforts whereas country b took some efforts but its emission cuts were not as great as it promised and hence country b is far away from its target but since paris climate deal is binding which means that if you have promised this much amount of emission cut you need to attain that by a certain year country b needs to take some steps and hence what market mechanism does is that it provides for the transfer of these carbon credits which means the extra efforts which you have put from one country to that of another So as you can see country A's effort has been shown with the green color indicating the right action whereas the country's B effort has been shown to be with the red color which means deficit of action. So what market mechanism does is that it provides for the transfer of these credits from one country to another so that each country meets its own targets at the same time some countries can earn the revenue out of it. So as you can see country A has transferred its extra credit to country B in the target year country A has 
its target and achievement balanced and the country b at the same time has its targets and achievements balanced now it was expected that the rules for this transfer of the credits and the pricing on which this transfer shall be carried out will be finalized but there was no agreement on that now since the focus of this video is on answer writing we shall not go into details of such transfers but to understand all these concepts in a greater detail you can watch our qip program or you can watch our dns videos to understand the finer details of these concepts but the bottom line is that there was no agreement on market and non market mechanisms dealt in article 6 of paris climate deal now next important concept is enhanced action now enhanced action means that whatever you have promised you need to step up your efforts because if we take into account the nationally determined contributions of all the countries those efforts will not be enough to contain the climate change within 1.5 degree celsius so to illustrate this we have taken a graph from ipcc website which shows on the y axis the temperature change from pre industrial level and on the x axis we have time and as you can see in 2017 the global warming was already 1 degree more than pre industrial level and our target is to contain it within 1.5 degree celsius so you can see that we only have 0.5 degree celsius of space left so if we extrapolate the temperature change keeping into account the current level of emissions we are going to have more than 3 to 4 degree celsius of temperature change by the end of 2100 which means after 80 years but if we take into account the actions which the governments have promised across the world and if we assume that they are able to abide by those actions then the temperature change will be less than 3 to 4 degree celsius but again that will not be enough to restrict the temperature change below 1.5 degree celsius as you can see with this yellow line and hence in order to limit the temperature change below 1.5 degree celsius which is the line shown in the black color all the countries across the world are needed to ramp up their ndcs or they need to increase their commitment to climate action and that is enhanced action and it was believed that at madrid there will be some agreement or at least some consensus on how to approach this enhanced action but a lot of countries including china and india did not agree to any aspect of enhanced action citing the examples of developed countries because what china and india believe is that first all the countries should at least come clean on whatever they have promised and then we can talk about increasing the commitments but there are other issues as well and again they have been discussed in detail in our qip videos as well as in our dns and the final concept which is needed to understand the failure of these un and climate talks is compensation for loss and damage now compensation for loss and damage talks about the historical contribution of the developed countries towards climate change now you understand that most of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from industrial development and since developed countries are the one in which the industrialization took place quite early they are responsible for maximum historical emissions but if you analyze the impacts of global warming in the form of climate change the maximum loss and damage is being suffered in developing nations be it impact of erratic weather on agriculture or increasing frequency of natural disaster you can consider any aspect of climate change and you will find out that developing countries are the ones which are most affected and hence developing nations want liability to be fixed on developed nations and finalize a mechanism for compensation for the acts which they have done and the profits which they have derived from industrialization now obviously you can see that there could not be any agreement on either the financial or the technological aspect of climate change mitigation and such transfers to developing nations so these are the three important tools if utilized properly can aid our fight against climate change so in order to facilitate the achievement of more ambitious climate change targets and ensure faster transition to a low carbon economy The government is seeking to strengthen a 20-year-old law, Energy Conservation Act 2001, which has powered the first phase of India's shift. 
to a more energy efficient future the bill to amend energy conservation has two main objectives first it seeks to make it compulsory for a select group of industrial commercial and even residential consumers to use green energy a prescribed minimum proportion of the energy they use must come from renewable or non fossil fuel sources and second it seeks to establish a domestic carbon market and facilitate trade in carbon credits so by now you already understand what carbon credits are and how they will be applicable under paris climate deal so domestically the same concept will be applicable to individual industrial houses or establishments where you will be set a target which you have to meet and if you are not able to meet the target just like the nations when they overshoot their commitments you have you will have to compensate it by purchasing the credits so first let us understand the energy conservation act which defines standards for energy conservation and efficiency to be followed by select group of industries and commercial complexes efficiency standards were also prescribed for equipment and appliances and that's where you have star labeling which was enabled through a statutory body known as bureau of energy efficiency the task of which was to promote the use of more efficient processes and equipment in order to save energy the star ratings on various household appliances and the large scale shift to led bulbs were some of the successful initiatives of bureau of energy efficiency that have resulted in massive energy savings over a period of time the overall objective has been to improve energy efficiency across sectors so that much more productivity can be obtained from the same amount of energy over the years india's energy intensity or the amount of energy consumption per unit gdp has declined significantly as a result of these initiatives taken by bee which was enabled through energy conservation act so what are the new provisions the amendment bill seeks to build upon the progress made so far for example just like the standards for appliances and equipment energy consumption standards would be specified for motor vehicles ships and other water vessels industrial units and buildings in the case of vehicles and water vessels fuel consumption norm would also be defined and just like it is for appliances and equipments the new provisions would empower the government to prohibit the manufacture or import of any vehicles or water vessels if it does not conform to the prescribed energy standards new sustainable building codes are to be defined which every building with a certain threshold of energy consumption whether industrial commercial or residential would have to adhere to every such building would have to ensure that at least a part of its total energy consumption comes from renewable or non fossil fuel sources this would help in reducing the proportion of fossil fuel based energy being used in the economy and push the demand for renewable or other non fossil fuels now coming on to creation of domestic carbon markets the creation of domestic carbon market is one of the most significant provisions of the proposed amendment bill carbon markets allow the trade of carbon credits with the overall of objective of bringing down emissions these markets create incentives to reduce emissions or improve energy efficiency for example an industrial unit which outperforms the emission standards stands to gain credits another unit which is struggling to attain the prescribed standards can buy these credits and show compliance to these standards the unit that did better on the standards earns money by selling credits while buying unit is able to fulfill its operating obligations and that is what we have understood in the first section of this discussion so under the international conventions we first had kyoto protocol which was the predecessor of paris agreement where the carbon markets have worked at the international level as well the kyoto protocol had prescribed emission reduction targets for a group of developed countries other countries did not have such targets but if they did reduce their emissions they could earn carbon credits these carbon credits could then be sold off to these developed countries which had an obligation to reduce emissions but were unable to this system functioned well for a few years but the market collapsed because of the lack of demand for carbon credits as the world negotiated a new climate treaty in place of kyoto protocol the developed countries no longer felt the need to adhere to their targets under the kyoto protocol a similar carbon market is envisaged to work under the successor paris agreement but its details are still being worked out so what can be some of the global examples of well functioning carbon credit markets or carbon markets so domestic or regional carbon markets are already functioning in several places most notably in europe where an emission trading scheme or ets works on similar principles 
industrial units in europe have prescribed emission standards which they have to adhere to and they buy and sell credits based on their performance surprisingly china too has a domestic carbon market a similar scheme for incentivizing energy efficiency has been running in india for over a decade now which is known as pat or perform achieve and trade which allows units to earn efficiency certificates if they outperform the prescribed efficiency standards the lagards can buy these certificates to continue operating the next article which we have taken has appeared in today's science and technology page in the hindu newspaper why strengthening genomic surveillance is an imperative so the article basically talks about improving and strengthening genomic surveillance and why is it of utmost importance as of now especially in the backdrop of covid-19 pandemic and the next emerging pandemic which is monkeypox now basics regarding monkeypox has already been taken in our dns earlier and so we are going to keep ourselves limited just to the points raised in this particular article where the author talks about the emergence of monkeypox in 1970 where the virus was first reported however until very recently monkeypox virus infections have been largely restricted to countries in central and eastern africa but it was only in early 2022 that multiple cases were identified in spain and several cases were reported from the countries where the disease is not even endemic including regions in europe and north america and in patients with no history of travel to endemic regions which basically means that monkeypox is turning into the stage of local transmission and this is just not happening in africa but in europe in north america and now it's happening in india also people who had no history of travel to either africa or europe are now reporting symptoms and testing positive for monkeypox and just to give you an idea as of early august 2022 which means just this week over 25000 cases of monkeypox have been reported from around 83 countries across the globe and 76 out of these countries have never reported monkeypox cases before and that is the first time they are reporting it and so following a rapid rise in cases WHO on July 23 declared the current breakout of monkeypox as public health emergency which is colloquially known as global pandemic. Now after such a declaration it has become a legal duty on states to respond promptly to the number of cases and the steps that they are taking. But that is not the main argument of this article. The main argument of this article is strengthening genomic surveillance. why do we need to create a surveillance and strengthen it as far as the main concern of this article is about strengthening or improving genomic surveillance about enhancing our capabilities to monitor the genome sequence of various viruses and how they are evolving because it seems like the current outbreak is a result of a mutation in the virus and if we don't understand how mutations change the virus how they impact their transmissivity how they impact their fatality rates we will not be able to monitor and control the disease outbreak and it is important from the perspective of gs paper 3 in mains examination because awareness in the field of it space computers nanotechnology and biotechnology is a part of your syllabus and genome sequencing directly forms a part of biotechnology so the case of unexpected high rate of mutation in monkeypox viruses All of us know that it is a DNA virus unlike coronavirus which is an RNA virus. So monkeypox virus like other pox viruses was believed to have a small rate of accumulating genetic changes compared to viruses with RNA genome like SARS-CoV-2. So the rate of genetic mutation is very low when the virus has DNA material but it is very high when it has RNA sequence. So for example for pox viruses which are again DNA viruses the rate is estimated to be as low as a couple of genetic changes every year and compare this with coronavirus where the major mutations happen almost every other month but a recent study has revealed that the observed rate of genetic changes in the viruses was higher than expected on an average around 50 genetic changes per year so the higher than expected rate of evolution coupled with rapid rise in monkeypox cases across the world could potentially be due to highly parallel evolution in large number of individuals simultaneously as the present breakout came out of a super spreader event 
what it basically means is that you had first local endemic population of people containing monkeypox these people took the viruses and created lot of small population for example let's say one in europe and one in north america and there these viruses got a lot of time to evolve parallelly and mutations have happened parallelly and it's just a coincidence that both of the things have happened at the same time so what genome sequencing is and what or how it can help us in understanding the outbreak of diseases so researchers from across the world have made available over 650 complete genome sequences of monkeypox in public domain where the genome sequencing means revealing the order of bases present in the entire genome of an organism DNA nucleotides all of us know from the basic understanding of NCRT contains a various combinations of adenine cytosine guanines and thymine and as you can see on the screen varying combination of these bases form different DNA structures and whenever these sequences change we call them a mutation not all mutation might help the virus but some of them definitely do and that is when they become a cause of concern and that is why frequent genome sequencing and reporting is basically genome surveillance is very very important so genome surveillance is the process of constantly monitoring pathogens and analyzing their genetic similarities and differences genomic surveillance of pathogens could provide unique insights into understanding the outbreak better understanding the evolution much more accurately so whenever there will be a major change in the base sequences you will immediately know it track the spread of the pathogens so unless and until we carry out the genome sequences of coronavirus we would not know which of the strain has spread into which of the regions then also it can be extremely helpful to support vaccine development for emerging infectious diseases because unless and until we know the exact genome sequence we would not be able to create the formula for the vaccine it can provide immense opportunities for public health decision making as well as for epidemiology the prevalence of different lineages of viruses across different regions is something which has been a cause of concern so for example over 95 percent of the recently deposited genome sequences of the viruses belong to b1 lineage of monkeypox virus and this lineage is epidemiologically linked to the super spreader events in Europe and that's how we know that Europe became the main spreading point from where the virus has spread across the globe and facing the current global pandemic then it helps us to keep accelerated evolution due to mutation so for example the monkeypox virus has a DNA genome of around 2 lakh base pairs roughly six times larger than SARS-CoV-2 like other viruses, the monkeypox virus evolves by the accumulation of genetic errors or mutations in its genome when it replicates inside a host. Information about mutations occurring in different genome sequences of the monkeypox virus across different regions can thus provide essential insights into how the virus is evolving, its genetic diversity, and other factors that may be relevant to the development of diagnostic tools. And finally, genetic surveillance of pathogen provides interesting insights by following a molecular approach for contact tracing and understanding the transmission of the viruses across the world. And so in this regard, WHO has come up with global genome surveillance strategy for pathogens with pandemic and epidemic potential for 2022 to 2032 period, where it has five objectives, improve access to tools for better geographical representation, strengthen the workforce to deliver at speed, scale and quality, enhance data sharing and utility for streamline local to global public health decision making and action, maximizing connectivity for timely value add in broader surveillance architecture and to maintain a readiness posture for emergencies. The next article has appeared in the Hindu newspaper Data Law Delay. So recently the government withdrew the personal data protection bill that it had tabled in the Lok Sabha in 2019. The bill had undergone intense scrutiny by Joint Parliamentary Committee and now the bill would be replaced by a new bill that fits into comprehensive legal framework. So why did government had to bring a bill on data protection or data regulation? And the origins of this bill can be traced in a very significant judgment known as Case Putta Swami vs Union of India case where the Supreme Court of India in 2017 
upheld the right to privacy as an intrinsic part of the right to life and personal freedom guaranteed by Indian constitution. In the light of this judgment and the concerns around how large tech platforms were handling the personal data of its Indian users, the centre in 2017 set an expert committee chaired by retired Chief Justice, Justice B. N. Sri Krishna to formulate a regulatory framework for data protection. The Sri Krishna committee submitted its report and a draft for data protection bill to the Ministry of Electronics and Communication Technology in 2018. The bill that was tabled by ministry in parliament over a year later was however criticized by Justice B. Sri Krishna for giving much more control to central government over the data than envisaged in the committee's draft. And so, because of these criticisms, the government had to withdraw a bill. And there are four main reasons behind the withdrawal of the bill. First was that the Joint Parliamentary Committee had recommended 97 corrections and improvements to the bill. One of the key recommendations is widening the ambit of the bill to cover all data instead of just personal data, thus moving it considerably away from Putta Swami origins. The stated view of the government is that in the face of such a radical overhaul, it is better of course to bring a new bill. Alongside this, the government has also said that it received several concerns from the tech industry, specifically from Indian startups, regarding the stipulations on data localization in the bill. Then the second was issue of data localization. Personal data was defined in the bill as any characteristic, trait, attribute or any other feature information that can be used to identify a person. The bill also identifies a subcategory of sensitive personal data such as details on a person's finance, health, sexual orientation, practices, caste, political and religious beliefs and biometric and genetic data. It also created a critical personal data category which was personal data as may be notified by the central government. The bill stated that while sensitive personal data can be transferred abroad for processing, a copy of it must be kept in India. Critical personal data can be stored and processed only in India. It also stipulates the condition under which sensitive data can be sent abroad, such as government authorized contracts. Several countries have such localization provisions considering the strategic and commercial implications of the data as the new oil. However, businesses both big and small, international and local have issues with such localization clauses. Then a lot of concerns were raised by the tech industry. Indian startups have raised the issue that the infrastructure needed to comply with the localization stipulations will be a huge drain on their resources. Startups also often depend on international companies for services such as customer management, analytics and marketing, which will require them to send data on their customers abroad. Data localization requirements would not only reduce their choices on such services but also burden them with compliance processes. The compliance requirements have implications for the larger US-based tech companies as well, with reports indicating that umbrella organizations of US like Alphabet, which controls Google, and their businesses were lobbying against the bill. And then finally implications on and finally implications on social media platforms. One of the joint parliamentary committee recommendation would also have been of particular concern for social media companies as it sought to move them from category of online intermediaries to content publishers, thus making them responsible for the posts they host. And so if the bill was passed, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram could be held accountable and liable for inflammatory and derogatory posts. And so because of these concerns, the government had to withdraw the bill. Now it still remains to be seen whether the government comes up with a new bill where all these issues are addressed or most of these issues are addressed and whether it will be acceptable to all the stakeholders or not. This last article which we have taken is very important from the perspective of prelims examination, Rajasthan's Nadi's and insurance against a dry summer. So Nadi is a local word for small ponds in villages which are in the form of shallow depressions across the rural landscape where the rainwater gets collected and that becomes the source of water throughout the year. Let us now move on to the question of the day.